From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. With nearly 18,000 students and an alumni of more than 130,000, the University of Rhode Island is the state's flagship school. After 12 years of leadership under David Dooley, URI's future is in new hands. Our guest this week on Newsmakers, University of Rhode Island President Mark Parlange. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi, Mark Palange, President of the University of Rhode Island. Welcome to the program. It's good to have you. Good to be here this morning. And Thank I should you. say welcome back to Rhode Island. Uh, a few people might not know you were here for a hot minute. Uh, you were here for, uh, you were born in Providence for all of four, four months, but then uh, moved, grew up overseas. You came back to Rhode Island in August, I think, right, um, after you were hired at URI. Coming from uh, Monash University in Australia, uh, where you were provost, so that was quite a decision to travel 10,000 miles back to the ocean state. Why did you want the job? Well, as I tell everyone at the University of Rhode Island, the best job in the world is actually to be president of URI. I have just uh, been thrilled to be back uh, in Rhode Island. It's been the, the community is fantastic from our faculty, staff, students, and, uh, and our alumni. And, uh, and more broadly, I, I'd say the state of Rhode Island, people have really reached out and in so many different ways, the University of Rhode Island, how we're going to go is going to really uh, impact the future of the state. So I, I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to be working with so many great people. Uh, you know, one of the, the perennial prickly issues that comes up uh, with the state's colleges and universities is the amount of financial support from the state um, to URI. The university has seen a reduction in state aid over the last 20 years. If the state budgeted more money for the university, which I'm sure uh, you would appreciate, what would what would that look like for the university? What, what would change on campus if the state was providing more revenue? Well, first, I, I want to say that the citizens of Rhode Island have been incredibly supportive of the university, and they have really helped us with uh, crucial infrastructure that's allowing us to, to grow. So through in, bonds. Through bonds. So that, that has been uh, key. But uh, indeed, uh, the university is so important. We are at an important, I believe, inflection point in the state, and it's an opportunity really to drive and expand in, for example, in the blue economy, the sustainable use of ocean resources. So an investment in, in the University of Rhode Island is really going to be an investment, I believe, in the future of the state. Is there a certain amount you think you'd like to see, or you know, a, a dollar figure that you think would be sustainable permanent funding for URI from the state? Yeah, so if we, if we went back, say, 20 years' time and we looked at what the state was providing support for Rhode Island residents, then there would be, uh, per uh, state student, about $6,500 in additional support towards mm -hmm. the university. So that, that would give you, so, and with the growth of in-state students, that, that's some 40, 45 uh, million. Obviously, that's not going to happen <laughs> overnight, but let's work together. We're also looking at how we can expand federal support for programs. We're also looking for private, you know, really partnering with companies to build the innovation ecosystem. And, and then finally, uh, we, we believe that there's uh, huge opportunities to attract companies uh, to join here. So uh, you mentioned uh, out-of-state students and in-state students, that mix. URI's current student population, it's about, it's about half and half, slightly more in-state, I believe. And the, the share of out-of-staters has gone up in the last decade. And those students are more lucrative to the university. They pay, I think, like about $20,000 more to attend. Do you see that mix staying where it is, about 50-50? You, could you see out-of-state students growing even more than that, or do you think this is kind of where it'll stay for a while? Well, it's interesting. We are one of only 30% of universities that's actually growing in terms of student applications. We have a, a national draw. Uh, we have you know, top 50 programs in oceanography, engineering, uh, nursing, pharmacy. So it's, it's not surprising that students want to come. Obviously, we have a beautiful location. We're located next to the ocean. So the, the theme, the ocean, marine studies, uh, sailing, 
surfing, you know, it, it does attract students to come to the University of Rhode Island. So um, that's important. But I think uh, just one quick point, 90% of all our students receive some form of financial aid that are coming to the University of Rhode Island. So we are extremely generous and attractive, I think, for students to come. But do you think, do you see that 50-50 split being about where you are will stay for the you know, medium term? Um, on the medium term, probably not, given that the, uh, the number of grade 12 graduates from uh, Rhode Island and New England or the Northeast are, is actually going down. Mm. And, and there's other parts of the country, like the South or parts of the West, that are growing, and we are attracting students well, from there. Well, before I give it back to Tim, just because sure. I, I had a question on that, and we've been hearing now for years New England higher ed leaders talking about this demographic cliff as the number of K-12 students, which is the pipeline into the colleges, is going to go down. Just There are just fewer of them in the population. As a public university, yeah, how concerned is URI about that? And is it, or is it not as big a concern as for some of these smaller private institutions that seem really worried about it? Yeah, well, uh, one thing that's very important, all Rhode Island students that are qualified, we admit to the University of Rhode Island, and we do everything in our power to be able to support them, to be able to provide, uh, you know, a very attractive uh, education. We're changing lives at the University of Rhode Island, and I'm, I just feel so good as, uh, as I've gone out in, in Providence or in, uh, around the state and met graduates and they talk about uh, how they were members of talent development. This is something that the University of Rhode Island has been committed to for 50 years and it's, it's really changed lives and it's really brought uh, students that otherwise may not have gone to university. So that's, that's really part of our uh, DNA, if you will. The University of Rhode Island is special in that way. Uh, yeah. President Parlange, I read an interview that you gave uh, recently, and you called some of the infrastructure at the school, quote, atrocious, which is not a subtle word by uh, no. any standard, and uh, honestly not a great billing for the campus, I, I think. What infrastructure at URI falls into the atrocious category? Okay. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like you have a wind-up for it. Right yeah, here. yeah, so um, look, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier the blue economy and the importance of that in terms of the future of the state. And we have a beautiful location at the Narragansett Bay campus, mm -hmm. but the infrastructure that was there was put in 60 years ago, essentially in temporary buildings. And those temporary buildings over the last 60 years have decayed. And so we have, we started ocean engineering at the University of Rhode Island, and yet they're in temporary buildings that are leaking. So that's what I mean by atrocious. And so that's the opportunity because this is where we can really innovate. This is where we can attract companies. We're hoping to build over there a, a blue technology innovation hub. We're hoping to really uh, transform the economy. And it, it's very much like I used to be in Switzerland and how we transformed Western Switzerland at EPFL. I believe we can do the same at the University of Rhode Island and with the state of Rhode Island. And and how are you going to do that? I, I noticed that you had uh, tweeted out recently that the university is, quote, going strong a after using HERF funds to provide millions of dollars in aid to the school. And, you know, the feds love their acronyms, but HERF is the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund, which is part of the federal uh, COVID relief money. Is that, how much are we talking about, is, and is that where you see funding these types of infrastructure improvements? No, so that was really to support our students. The University of Rhode Island did extremely well through COVID. Um, I'm just uh, delighted with the performance of, of our students, faculty, and staff. Uh, our, our community was safe. Um, we actually spent quite a bit more than we s received from the federal funding on you know, supporting our students and faculty and staff on COVID. Um, for the infrastructure, obviously I've made a, a substantial ask uh, for ARPA funding. And I, again, as said earlier, I'm grateful to the citizens who have supported us through geo bonds. And so I, I will be going there. But as I said, we're going to broaden it. We just submitted a, a, a major grant uh, for Build Back Better to the federal uh, EDA programs around blue economy, around aquaculture, around offshore wind. These are very important areas for the future of the state. And so I believe these are important investments. The governor's budget has $50 million um, for a bond question that would go on the ballot this year for the Narragansett Bay campus. I believe you or I originally asked for $150 million for that project. That's a pretty big gap between the money and the bond and what you thought was necessary. Is that gap easily filled if it's only a $50 million bond? 
Uh, no. So, uh, <laughs> no. So it's I I indeed it's 157.5 uh, that we're uh, that we will need to transform the next phase of the campus. But I think it's important if we go back to uh, phase one where we received 45 million dollars in geo bond, we were able to translate that very quickly into more than 225 million dollars worth of, uh, of research support and infrastructure. So for example, the Narragansett Dawn, our new research vessel that's going to come online in 2024, that's 125 million. If we didn't invest in a new dock, then you can't have the, have the ship. And we had to be part of a, a major national uh, competition and so we were one of three in the country that were able to get a new research vessel. So how do you fill the gap? So uh, part of it is I think we have to uh, be honest, we have to explain uh, where we are, we have to show what is possible and that these investments will actually translate into growth, growth of the economy. It's going to provide ultimately uh, opportunities for all of Rhode Island to be able to come to the university, K through 12. We're going to partner with obviously CCRI and other groups and we're going to be able to create uh, high paying jobs that I think is going to be good for the state. And would you like to see the legislature increase the bond question then? 50 to closer to what you say, the 157 that's needed? Yes. Yes. Um, I want to ask you too about, while we're on that topic, you, you keep mentioning the blue economy. This is, I know, a huge focus for you. And um, as I understand it, that's economic development based on Rhode Island's proximity to the ocean and the coastline. That could be defense, aquaculture, energy industries like offshore wind. I am curious, beyond the branding, having sort of a name for all that, what do you think is important about calling all those activities, many of which are already happening, the blue economy versus them just kind of happening like they are now? Well, it's, it's important that we organize. It's, so the blue economy really talks about the sustainable use of ocean resources. It's, uh, if you look, for example, right now from New Jersey up to Maine, there's some 60 gigawatts potential there of wind energy. We have a lead at, uh, at Rhode Island. We, we have the first and, and basically the only offshore w wind farm at the moment. Um, they're obviously not all going to be built off of uh, Rhode Island, but the opportunity for us to be a center hub there is extremely important. I, I feel very good about that. We've pulled together with uh, the Secretary of Commerce and with some 121 partners around the state to be able to make this next, next ask at the federal level. But it's also about aquaculture. You know, it's about food security, and we can be a leader there, and we're, we're partnering with industry. So that's very important. We're very society-facing. And then you mentioned defense. That's an important part of the Rhode Island economy. It's an area where we lead as a nation in underwater uh, technology, underwater robotics. We partner with our friends at the University of Connecticut to Woods Hole. So that's, that's important. It, it's really an area where I think Rhode Island can lead. The school loosened its mask policy earlier this month as uh, CDC guidelines were adjusted, um, but the masks are, masks are still required in, in classrooms, in labs, et cetera. Do you see that being the policy to the end of the year, or could you see masks being optional entirely? Yeah, so good question. We, we have followed the CDC guidelines, and we have really been aligned with the state and with the governor of the state. And I was really grateful uh, for the governor coming down for the announcement when we announced uh, vaccine mandates. So that was extremely important. Um, as I said, the incidence of COVID on campus has been really dampened, and I think it's not only the uh, vaccine programs very important, but the masking. A week ago, uh, this is a spring break. Uh, we relaxed the rules, but we wanted to keep it uh, in classrooms. We're going to see the week after spring break how the numbers go. We're, we do careful testing, of course, on campus. Assuming that the numbers don't come back, then we're going to assume that we can transition. One uh, question, we're, again, we're getting low on time, but I'm, I'm curious, a, a broader thing uh, beyond just URI, there's been a lot of concern in recent years about whether the intellectual climate on American college campuses is becoming less hospitable to free speech and alternative points of view. Some people call that cancel culture, others have other names for it. Do you share that concern or do you think it's overblown? I, I, well, I believe that on the university it's extremely important for us to be able to have open uh, and respectful debate with each other. I believe that, you know, 
these kind of labels of canceling actually uh, serves to do exactly that, to actually dampen the discussion. So I, I'm not in favor of that kind of term. I think it's extremely important that we are deep in our knowledge and then we want to learn from other people, we want to share with other people. So it's the university is actually the environment where we can have healthy and informed and educated debate and discussion. Mark Parlange, president of the University of Rhode Island, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you so much. Okay, when we come back, a major new development in a scandal that is rocking the North Kingstown School District. Stay with us, you're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi and Target 12 Investigator Eli Sherman. We're going to do a bit of a reporter's roundtable for the back half of the show here. And uh, Eli, we got to start with another big development in uh, uh, the North Kingstown uh, fat test scandal there. Two weeks ago, uh, we reported that Superintendent Phil Auger stepped down ahead of a scathing report into how the administration in North Kingstown, the school administration, responded, or I suppose didn't respond um, to allegations that the then high school basketball coach Aaron Thomas was conducting naked fat tests on some students when they were alone with him. This is uh, the superintendent, Phil Auger, that is on the screen uh, there right now. And then on Thursday, we learned his number two, the assistant superintendent, Dr. Denise Mansiri, resigned. You know, since we first broke this story in November, Eli, it really feels like things are starting to happen now, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, just the last week, we've had more news on, on North Kingstown than we did sometimes at months at a time. Yeah. Um, and the assistant superintendent leaving is kind of a, a, big, a big element to this story because according to the report that came out earlier this week, she had the most documented interactions with students um, who, and, and concerns related to the naked fat tests. Uh, the first coming back in 2017, when another teacher had walked by and seen a, a student inside of the coach's office uh, without his shirt on. And then in 2018, she was also alerted to concerns about the naked fat test from another student. Fast forward to 2021, she got another notification from a student who was concerned and that sort of sparked everything right. where we are now. And the, the two of you have led are investigating on this uh, for our team, but you know we were talking the other day in the newsroom about just how many uh, different, I don't want to just say investigations because it's not just it's technically law enforcement investigations, but I guess people are examining this mm. in different jurisdictions. Can you kind of walk through all the, you know, the, the shoes that could drop in the coming months on this? Yeah, for sure. So earlier this week, the report that came out was a school com committee commissioned internal investigation. The second one. The second one. The first <laughs> one was completed last summer. Um, separate from that, the Rhode Island Attorney General Peter Narona is, has launched a criminal investigation into whether or not any crimes have been broken. We should mention that uh, Thomas has not been charged criminally with anything, uh, and he has denied any wrongdoing through his attorneys. Now, separate from the AG, the U.S. attorney has launched a civil rights investigation into the school department trying to examine whether or not uh, other adults surrounding Thomas responded appropriately uh, when concerns were raised in the past. And the town council is also doing its own review with a retired Superior Court judge, Susan McGurl. Um, so there's a lot of different people, and that's separate from the law enforcement, which of course is involved across the board. Yeah, and well, there's also one other on that list that I think is potential and likely, which is probably a civil suit on behalf of some of these former students. We've talked a lot to attorney Timothy Conlon, who represents uh, what will probably be plaintiffs uh, coming up in a lawsuit against maybe the school department, Aaron Thomas individually. So that's another thing to happen. But with the the attorney general investigation, it was interesting uh, to me, and I, I think to you as well, that we sort of got some insight right into the criminal investigation from this independent report that you referenced that was presented to the school committee on Monday. Uh, there was a, a, a former student that provided a statement but wasn't interviewed in person because the attorney conducting the, uh, the investigation wrote, um, 
quote, I was informed that the investigation from the office of the Rhode Island Attorney General did not want multiple accounts or interviews of potentially key witnesses. So this is someone, obviously, that prosecutors are talking to, and we learned a little bit. Uh, yeah, out of certainly. That. I think that, uh, it, it, like you said, it was a glimpse into what the Attorney General might be thinking in terms of his investigation. It's also the first time, Tim, that we saw uh, a, a former student really lay out explicitly that the interaction that he had with the coach turned sexual. Mm -hmm. He mentioned um, that the coach got aroused during one of these naked fat tests. And this happened, we should mention, within the last five years, which is a very key element in terms of trying to navigate what criminal charges might apply in this case if you know the law was broken. And we do expect the Attorney General, this isn't going to last months and months and months necessarily before they make a decision on whether they will press charges, right? Right. Actually, you know, oftentimes with Attorney General investigations, <laughs> we really are in the dark in terms of timing. But this week, uh, his office, uh, Peter Nerona's office, let us know that they do expect to wrap things up in some regard within the next two months. I, and I found myself as I read the, uh, was editing your story this week and read uh, parts of the report that, of course, there'll be people watching who say, they, I'm sure they're concerned by the allegations here, but, you know, it's North Kingstown, maybe they live somewhere else. But I have to think, you know, Philip Auger just a few years ago was superintendent of the year in Rhode yeah. Island. This is the, the North Kingstown superintendent who just resigned. So he's he was very prominent. Now he's lost his job there uh, due to this scandal effectively we know and you have to think this is being watched closely by education officials all over the state and we've seen before where uh you know it so far it appears that a lot of north kingstown officials were kind of you know they, they they saw this and they took small actions but we know that thomas had enormous clout in that community he was he'd been the basketball coach for years they were about to go to a championship and you wonder if this will be in the backs of the minds of education officials around going forward if they face these kind of very thorny personnel issues with important people in their school community. You know, it, you bring up a good point because uh, it did remind me of a, a case several years ago uh, that made a lot of headlines, which is a former uh, or a then principal of a Providence elementary school mm -hmm. named Violet Lamar, who was charged uh, with a misdemeanor, but it's a state law. It's a reporting requirement law where if any, uh, if anybody adult is aware of, of an allegation of sexual misconduct or abuse, on the part of another individual, you have to report that uh, to DCYF. And this was a case, I believe, of a gym teacher who was accused of sexual misconduct. She didn't report it to DCYF, and ultimately, um, I believe it was, she pled no low to that charge, but obviously she was out of a job. So to your point, as other school districts are looking at what is an unfolding in North Kingstown, particularly with, with this report that just came out about how the administration reacted in 2018, or to repeat myself, didn't react. I think this is one of those things that other school leaders are looking at as it applies to that reporting requirement state law. Right? Absolutely. I, that 2016 law, the reporting law, it was it, that all adults over 18 must report any abuse or suspected abuse, which is, you know, uh, all law is up to debate, as you well know, Tim. Mm -hmm. But there are certainly questions swirling around the North Kingstown School Department about who should have perhaps said something to uh, the, the state's child welfare agency back in 2018 or even before if any of these allegations had popped up. And I, I think it's safe to assume that that is very much something that law enforcement is examining mm -hmm. as well. All right, I want to shift gears a little bit, and Ted, uh, going to throw this one to you. It, it wouldn't be a newsmaker's if we didn't talk about the second congressional yeah, right. race. Yeah. Uh, and we have a new entrant into the race, uh, a, a Republican, Jessica De La Cruz. Um, uh, what do we know? What did she say? You covered the announcement. Yeah, right? so she had an event in Cranston to formally kick off her campaign. Jessica De La Cruz is a second-term state senator. She lives up in North Smithfield, actually technically just out of the district, though she says uh, she's going to buy a house uh, in the district, as uh, she and her husband are looking. And, you know, she, she's one of three Republicans, along with Alan Fung and Robert Lancia. And it's interesting because um, you hear from Republicans, you know, Alan Fung, there's just no denying people think he starts with a lot of advantages sure. financially. Uh, he has a fundraising base from running statewide. He's got a base of support in Cranston. But um, Jessica De La Cruz has impressed a lot of uh, Republicans in recent years. She gave the response to Gina Raimondo's final state of the state last year. She's been very outspoken on issues like uh, coronavirus mandates and uh, suspending the state gas tax. And her message was uh, she, she cast the other uh, candidates in the second 
2nd District, Democrats and Republicans as millionaires and career politicians, described herself as a working mom to be sent to Congress. And so I think we're going to see whether in these, you know, as we've talked about with Joe Fleming on this show, Republican primaries are small and renowned. There's yeah. not a ton of Republicans, which means you don't have to persuade that many voters to swing a Republican primary here. But we also know Alan Fung with that base in Cranston has historically been able to overcome uh, because his support was so strong in the city, uh, weaker support in other parts of the state. So it's going to be interesting to see if Jessica De La Cruz can capitalize on that and also how much money the two of them raised. Is Alan Fung going to put up a big, big number for this quarter um, or will it be closer together? I, I got to ask, you mentioned that De La Cruz doesn't live in the district, which seems to be a recurring a theme, theme in, yes. in all of the candidates that we're hearing jumping into this race, whether they live outside the district or they're moving into the state to run. How important is that element to voters, do you think? You know, I, I never want to say we'll what the out. voters are going to think we're going to find out. I think a part of me wonders if it's diluted because we have multiple candidates who don't live in the district or I who just that. moved to Rhode Island full time fairly recently. And so it's almost becomes that so many people have it as an issue that it kind of neutralizes it. But it is. Rhode Island, I think people, you know, exp want to make sure they feel that the person they're voting for is connected to where they live. And so I think that's the task for these candidates who can't say they technically live in the district to show, but I'm, I'm part of the district, even if my address isn't there. All right. Stand by for the carpetbagger campaign ads <laughs> right. in the next few months. We'll see that. All right. Uh, Eli Sherman, Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. Thank you for watching Newsmakers. We'll see you next week.